and we're going to assume that the primary defect is in the body, not in the brain, and causes the excess accumulation of fat. I mean, we're dealing with a defect of fat accumulation. Let's assume that our fat tissue is regulated incorrectly. And in this case, overeating and inactivity are compensatory effects or not causes. Because what the law of thermodynamics tells us is if something dysregulates our fat tissue so we start accumulating fat and getting heavier, we have to take in more calories than we expend to accommodate that. So we have to either eat more or be less active. So the way this was phrased to me is we don't get fat because we overeat. We overeat because our fat tissue is accumulating excess fat. So go to the next slide, 38. And this is the analogy, a growing child. This is the analogy the Europeans use. Um, the photo on the left is child 2006. He's about a year and a half old. April 2006, he weighs 20 pounds. It's the same photo on the right, same child. 2009, April, he weighs 45 pounds, okay? He's gained 25 pounds in three years. He's grown about 20 inches, I think. He had to have overeaten to accommodate that growth. He had to have taken in more calories than he expended. But he didn't grow because he overate. He overate because he was growing. And he was growing because he was secreting growth hormone. So this is the causality we're looking at. Growth causes overeating. We want to know what regulates the growth. Overeating doesn't cause growth. It's the other way around. And let's look at the next slide, 39, just to give you an extreme example. The fellow on the left is the world's tallest man. He was 8 foot 11. He weighed about 490 pounds when he died at age 22. At five, almost 500 pounds, this man was in positive energy balance probably his whole life, right? Um, the fellow on the right, Manuel Ribe, used to be the second or third fattest man on the right since then he's lost some weight. Um, he weighed 1,300 pounds, but let's assume Manuel Ribe, I think when he was about 20, he weighed about 500 pounds. So we have two people weigh 500 pounds. One happens to be 8 feet 11. He walks into your office, your physician. The first thing you're going to do is scan his brain to look for the tumor in his pituitary gland that's getting him to over-secrete growth hormone. And because he's over-secreting growth hormone, his growth is out of control, and he's taking in more calories than he expends because of it. The man on the right at 20 comes into your office at 500 pounds. The first thing you're going to do is give him a lecture about eating less and exercising more. The man on the left, you're going to assume that growth causes overeating. The man on the right, you are going to assume overeating causes growth. And the question is, why make that differentiation? Why don't we always assume that growth causes positive energy balance, not the other way around? So go to the next slide, 40. Prior to the Second World War, this was known as the lipophilia hypothesis of obesity. It was a German-Austrian hypothesis. It was put forth first by Gustav von Bergmann, who was the foremost internal medicine specialist in Germany up through the war. Um, today, the uh, leading prize in the German Society of Internal Medicine is named after von Bergmann. And then it was taken up by Julius Bauer in the 1920s. Julius Bauer was a professor of endocrinology and genetics at um, the University of Vienna. He was probably the leading expert in the world in the effect of, gen uh, of genetics and constitution on chronic disease risk. By 1940, it was more or less fully accepted in Europe. And the problem is 1940 was a very bad year for Europe. So this German theory basically vanished, just as it was being accepted. And it, the, unfortunately, after World War II, it was in bad taste to read the German literature, and nobody did it. Um, prior to World War II, the best medical research in the world, virtually all the medical research in the world worth discussing, was done in Germany, Austria, Italy, and France. Um, the U.S. had... You know, uh, anyone in the U.S. who wanted to do this kind of research had to read and speak German to keep up, and usually did your, you know, your doc postdoctoral work in Germany or Austria with these experts, and that whole school just vanished with the war. Um, this hypothesis, the lipophilia hypothesis, was based on clinical observations of the kind I've just talked to you about, difference between, you know, sex variations and fattening. The fact, for instance, that we fatten in some places and not others. So if you look now at the back of your hands, you'll see that we don't fatten on the back of our hands. We don't fatten on our forehead, but we do fatten others. And people fatten, and you, you know, some people get fat below the neck, double chins, 
other people don't. Some people get fat on their ankles, other people don't. Um, very specific places on the body will accumulate fat and other places won't in the same way that we grow hair in some places and others don't and others we don't. And these Europeans, Bauer and Bergman, say, look, just like we grow hair in some places and we don't and we get fat in some places and other places we don't, obviously there are various factors, hormonal factors, central nervous system factors, um, you know, enzymes, receptors that, that determine this. We also get fat in some places we don't know elsewhere. Obviously, that's also determined by these same types of factors. And the fact that some people are hairier than others could also explain some people are fatter than others. The same kind of um, factors are involved. And the way they, they term this predisposition to accumulate fat, lipophilia, which means lip, love of fat. And the idea was those constitutionally predisposed to put on fat of adipose tissue that's more lipophilic than the constitutionally lean. And this is how Bauer put it in, in 1929. He said, like a malignant tumor of the fetus, the uterus of the breast of the pregnant woman, the abnormal lipophilic tissue seizes on foodstuffs, even in the case of undernutrition. It maintains its stock and may increase it independent of the requirements of the organism. A sort of anarchy exists. The adipose tissue lives for itself and does not fit into the precisely regulated management of the whole organism. So let's go to slide 42. Um, you could just look at animal models of obesity and ask this question, which way does the causality go when you have obese animals? Did the animals, when you have whatever the intervention is, does it make the animals somehow eat more or exercise less, and is that why they accumulate fat? Or does it make the animal accumulate fat and eating more and exercising less are side effects, they're compensatory effects? And I'll give you one example, the top one. This is slide 42, overreactomized rats. And these experiments were done by a fellow named George Wade at UMass in the 70s. George, um, the, the, the idea is you remove the ovaries from female rats, obviously, and the rats eat voraciously. They get what's called hyperphagic, and they get obese very quickly when you do this. And it's pretty clear that the functional thing is you're removing estrogen because if you infuse estrogen back into these rats, they will um, stop, the hyperphagia will go away and they'll, they won't gain weight, or if they're already obese, they'll lose the weight. So if you just do this experiment, you remove the ovaries, you see this ex voracious eating, this hyperphagia and the obesity, you would think normally, well, obviously what estrogen does is somehow suppress eating behavior. So when I remove the estrogen, the animal begins to eat um, out of control, it eats too much, and then it gets fat, and so it confirms my preconceptions at eating too much makes the animal fat. But then what Wade did is he did the same experiments, but he controlled for overeating. In effect, he put the animals on diets from the moment they came out of surgery, so they couldn't eat any more than a lean rat did or any more than they ate prior to the surgery. And when you control for overeating, you see the very same effect. You don't see the hyperphagia because the animal can't be hyperphagic, but you still see the obesity. And instead, these animals are extremely sedentary. And George Wade was the first one who said to me, look, when you look at it both ways, what removing the estrogen does is literally makes the animal accumulate fat in its fat tissue. Actually, estrogen suppresses an enzyme on the, on the membrane of the fat tissue called lipoprotein lipase. What lipoprotein lipase, LPL, does is it pulls calories, pulls fat from the bloodstream, simplistically put it into the fat tissue. So when you remove the estrogen, the fat tissue upregulates LPL and starts pulling fat, the fat tissue gets voracious, the animal starts accumulating fat, and now it's losing energy into its fat tissue, it has to compensate, and the way it does it is by eating, eating more, and if you don't let it eat more, it does it by expending less, because it had less to expend. And Wade was the first one who ever said to me, the animal doesn't get fat because it overeats, it overeats because we've made it get fat. We've done that by removing the estrogen. In all these animal models of obesity, if you lesion the VMH of a ventromedial hypothalamus of an animal, of transgenic animals, genetic models, hibernators, even diet-induced obesity, what you could show with each one, whenever someone has cared to look, is that the animal will get fat even if it's not allowed to take in any more calories than a lean mouse does. Um, and some of these genetic models, like zucker rats, which are or zucker mice, which are um, they have a leptin defect, but you can starve these mice to death, and they will die with four to five times as much fat tissue on their body.